The 2021-2022 school year marks the 50th anniversary of Title IX. This landmark legislation led to a national movement that now provides opportunities for over 140,000 female student-athletes in Illinois. The opportunities for today's athletes were built on the perseverance of those athletes, coaches, administrators, and officials who came before. In this episode of Leaders and Legends, IHSA staff explores one of those experiences. Celebrating the 50th anniversary of Title IX, the IHSA presents Leaders and Legends. I'm Tracy Henry, Assistant Executive Director of the IHSA and Administrator in Charge of Girls Gymnastics. I'm joined today by leaders in our state as we share perspective on Title IX and how it's impacted girls gymnastics. The 2021-22 school year marks the 50th anniversary of Title IX. This landmark moment for female athletes led to a movement here in Illinois where over 140,000 female high school athletes now compete annually across 18 IHSA sports. The opportunities for today's athletes were built on the perseverance of those who came before them. Today, we'll celebrate IHSA Girls Gymnastics, and joining us to share their stories are Kathy Krebs, Betty Axelson McCallan, and Robin Stroud. To get started, I've asked each of them just to share a little bit of how they're connected with the IHSA and Girls Gymnastics and how they've also been connected in the past. So, Robin, I'm going to start with you. What's your connection? Well, my connection was that I was lucky enough to um, be in high school in, uh, from 1970 to 1974, and then went on to be a teacher and a coach for the next 35 years. So I was connected to the IHSA through teaching and coaching, gymnastics, volleyball, and um, my uh, teaching was in physical education. And then now I'm a retired teacher and currently involved with judging gymnastics for the past eight seasons. And Kathy, how about you? I started off um, as a teacher of physical education um, and I would call it a sponsor because that's all that we were referred to in the early days of uh, girls gymnastics. It really wasn't an approved sport but we were expected to do some sort of coaching in each one of our high schools that we were teaching at and then became an official coach with actual um, stipend is what it was called and throughout all this time i started judging in college and uh, there was a great need in college for judges at that level and then um, i judged uh, also club gymnastics. And then the IHSA program started and a couple of friends called me and said, this is a really fun opportunity, not so much stress as in club <laughs> judging. Why don't you sign up? And so I signed up and my association was with Ola Bundy throughout those early years. I became the rule interpreter for her and um, and I'm now the head clinician. And through that association, I went on to become a consultant for the National Federation of State High School Associations for girls gymnastics. And um, I've worked with a number of administrators at the IHSA, Ola Bundy, um, Kurt, yourself, Tracy, um, Sue Henriksen, uh, and who was our former IHSA executive director that Marty Hickman, Dr. Hickman, Marty, doc, right, Marty Hickman. And so that's kind of my story along the way. I'm still currently involved as a judge and like I said, a head clinician. And um, I'm also an assigner of officials. And um, that's my connection. And I hope my connection will stay for a little while yet. <laughs> so Great. Betty, how about yourself? Well, I started off coaching and teaching at Mamie's High School. So um, I coached for 36 years. And we uh, started 
in 1976 to write the state manual for the state series so that we could host the first state meet at Maine East High School. And believe it or not, it was televised live for the first two years. So that was very exciting. And um, writing the manual, the state meet manual and some of the terms and conditions was a huge project. Kathy was one of those along with some of the other founding mothers of our sport. And so we had several meetings and Ola was at the helm uh, guiding us along. And so we had a lot of work, but a lot of fun doing it. And um, I was an officer for the Coaches Association in many different roles, always on rules committees. And I was a club judge and also high school judge and am still judging. And um, I was on the Hall of Fame committee. And then when Al Galati stepped aside, I took over for the Hall of Fame committee. Um, we also started a John Brinkworth Scholarship Award for boys and girls. So that's been um, a very rewarding project to see the girls and boys get scholarships now for not just their expertise in gymnastics, but for character. And um, I'm still a liaison for the Coaches Association, so I'm still very much involved with the current coaches. And um, Kathy has made it a wonderful experience to be involved in judging for these many years. So um, it's a passion and it's just in your blood. <laughs> So for everybody that's watching, um, you can hear the resumes of the people that are joining us here today, and they've been connected since the very beginning, whether it's coaching, competing, and all three of them are still currently licensed officials with our sport, uh, very much connected with what we do, and we rely on them heavily throughout the entire girls' gymnastics season. So we're excited to have them joining us here. Can you tell us just a little bit about Title IX and then how that affected you when it first went into place? Betty, I'll start with you. Well, the biggest impact was budget because when I started coaching, first of all, we didn't get paid. And second of all, our budget was $200. <laughs> so $200 in this sport gets you almost nothing. So just in terms of the impact, when we finally got a woman assistant AD, my budget like was six times what it was when we started. So Title IX was huge because it affected our facilities, <clears throat> our equipment, our uniform, everything. When Title IX actually filtered down to a woman getting an assistant AD position. So I was cheering like I have never had a budget that big when, <laughs> when you start with almost nothing. And then the other part was uniforms our girls wore the boys uniforms for years we never had uniforms for ourselves and finally it trickled down that we actually had a budget for uniforms so we were very excited to have our own uniforms so those those are two huge parts um facilities i can talk about later that's like another part that was like a huge impact so i can talk about that later robin how about you Wow. First of all, thank you for letting me speak today because it made me rethink everything that I've done along the way. But um, I started in high school before Title IX came along, but we, we had, in those days, we had, you know, the Girls Athletic Association. It was a club situation. So at Highland Park High School, I was on everything that they offered in a club setting. But that was um, play days, if I remember correctly. You would have um, a date with another school and you could do your sport, such as volleyball, you could play your sport. But I remember the schools coming over and you'd play a, a game and to maybe, maybe six points, maybe 10 points, and then you'd mix up the teams. So it would be Highland Park and Maine East playing against Highland Park and, and Maine East. There was no real competition. It was a play date. The other um, thing, opportunities that, that we had in a club setting was we were able to put on a gymnastics show that we worked very hard for over a weekend. Um, and many people came to the show, but we were not competing against other schools. And we had father-daughter activities like square dancing or 
ping pong blowing races, things like 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 that. That that. So I didn't know any better. <laughs> I loved everything we got to do, but we never were competing like the boys got to compete. And that all changed my um, junior year, my junior and senior year, and we because of Title IX. And so we got to compete against other schools. My my school was Highland Park. I remember competing against Betty's coach teams at Maine East, and I was a competitor. And we were very good. We were very lucky at Highland Park High School. I guess we were ready to be able to compete, probably because of our shows. And we went uh, undefeated those first two years in gymnastics. We were able to compete on multiple sports. I think I was on four, two at, at the same time, volleyball, gymnastics, softball, swimming, maybe even three at the same time. But it was the wild, wild west at that point. You know, getting coaches that knew what, what they were doing and, um, and female coaches at that. I just was really <laughs> at both Highland Park and then when I went on and I, I just was really lucky because I was at the start of everything. So it was perfect timing that way. Kathy, how about you? Tell us how Title IX affected you. Well, Title IX, it had lots of different effects. Uh, as a teacher, I'll just start that way. We used to teach physical education um, and segregated the sexes. In other words, the women teachers had to teach only women. They couldn't teach the boys. And the boys teachers only wanted to teach boys. They didn't want to teach the girls. So the sexes were separated. Um, and I'll just go into a, a small side note here. When we first started coaching, as I said, we were a sponsor. And we got a stipend as a sponsor, not as a coach. And Actually, I'll take that back. We didn't get anything at first. So there were several of us in our district that took a sick day. And we, uh, one of them made an appointment with a third year law student from Northwestern. And this is after Title IX had passed to find out what route we had to take in order to get our district to pay us. So this third year law student hooked us up with the EEOC and they filed a federal suit against our district so that we would be paid as coaches. I can tell you this, that we were not considered really coaches. We were supposed to be volunteers according to some of the male administrators for 20 years to put in our time as volunteers as some of them felt they had to do. So all in all, it was kind of an education process that we had to help primarily male administrators understand that we weren't from the GAA age anymore. We weren't doing postal um, meets anymore where you compete in your own gym and then you mail your results to the other school and they mail their results to you and the winner is the winner. You know, that's how it, it primarily started. But after Title IX, when um, boys and girls were able to be in the same PE class, it just like opened up a, a world for many girls that they didn't have to be frilly in PE. They could be rough and tumble. They could be active. They could compete against the boys. And it just brought out that competitive awareness that they too could be good at sports and become an athlete. And um, I think the ball started rolling at that point. I remember I had to buy our first conference trophy. I had to buy the trophy because our school wasn't gonna you know, pay for the trophy. We didn't have a budget. So as Betty was saying, there was no money. We, we managed to have a set of uh, uneven bars that were actually converted from parallel bars mm -hmm. from the boys and no floor X mat. We just tumbled on the wood floor and we took the pommels off of the pommel horse for vaulting and balance beam. I remember in my gym, a parent made a beam for us. And that's what we started on was this wood hunk that had iron legs on it. And so 
it was the first step, but you have to take a step somewhere. And from that point on, after Title IX, it was just like a ball and, and everything just exploded. There were so many opportunities for girls. It wasn't like there weren't coaches either. You know, there were a lot of women that maybe competed in college and they became the coaches. And so it spread from there. So Kathy mentioned opportunities. Betty, tell us some of the opportunities that came out of Title IX. Well, the first that we got a state meet. That was so exciting because like Robin said, we had play days and then we'd have meets against schools, maybe just in your conference, but to have a state meet was so exciting. So um, I think that really helped just in terms of publicity, girls could watch and see you know, their peers on TV. And they thought that was just absolutely the coolest thing. And uh, when our team won that first year, we had an all school assembly in the field house. So you had 4,000 kids that got to watch girls gymnastics in person after the state meet. And I thought, how great for these girls that they are looked to with um, just respect and admiration and uh, such role models for the girls to come after them. So um, yeah. I think just in terms of exposure, like just starting to have a state meet had just a great ripple effect. And then as far as uh, equipment, like all of a sudden we were able to get like more than one balance beam or you actually got real uneven bars and like actually eventually equipment evolved so that the girls now, like they would just flip if they had to compete on what we, what we started <laughs> with. Uh, but uh, even in terms of facilities like we had to set up and take down our equipment yeah. at mm -hmm. the beginning um, for the first three years we did not have a gym it was a gym that was used for physical education and then we got to use it after school and so you used an hour of your practice time to take down and set up equipment every single day so after years and years of pushing and trying every trick under the sun I finally got to move up to the boys gym which was just huge so we actually shared the facility but to get there it took uh, like moving mountains because um it was only the boys gym so that was huge and then girls being able to get scholarships, scholarships. that was so exciting that a girl could go on to college and actually get a scholarship in fact one of my gymnasts was on a dual scholarship for track and gymnastics at western illinois and like right now that's almost unheard of to be in two sports on scholarship but in those days i mean girls were so excited to just get a scholarship and to be able to do two sports was even <clears throat> like the icing on the cake so uh, it really opened up a, a whole new world for girls and i think really in terms of uh the impact the girls now it's good for them to hear these stories because they would never believe what kids went through in the early days and like Kathy said, coaches and judges, we all did it for as volunteers. We were not paid for years. So actually coaches getting a salary and then seeing the salaries eventually start to equalize with the men. I mean, because that took a long time. That didn't happen in the first couple of years. That took years. So, but I mean, when you look back, you're like, you're so happy that you were a part of at least getting the ball rolling and now you know we have so many great coaches and great judges and phenomenal gymnasts and you know it's because of the people that started like working really hard for no pay but because you did it for the love of the sport robin i think you may have been someone that benefited from the I, opportunity to have a scholarship absolutely um title nine gave me an identity, a purpose, confidence to walk through the school halls being so, high school halls being so proud to be a jock, being involved in, <laughs> in every single sport possible, to be able to um, practice and play um, in all my sports with the girls, with, my, with the boys, it made me know that I wanted to be a physical education teacher, that I wanted to be an athlete, that I wanted to coach, and doors were open. I, it was a perfect storm. It was, um, I wouldn't have had a scholarship otherwise. Um, I wouldn't have picked the schools 
that I picked because I didn't think I was ever going to be able to compete in gymnastics. I knew I wanted to to teach, so I I looked at at both of those. You know, what colleges had gymnastics and physical education, um, and then I applied to those, and I was accepted to to those, which I probably wouldn't have gotten into otherwise. Um, but I do remember that that. Um, you know, I was I was lucky enough to to compete. My coaches were catching up to us being able to compete. My my first um, gymnastics coach at Kent State in Ohio was was a wonderful uh, square dance teacher. Not <laughs> sure about about coaching, but wonderful <laughs> square dance teacher. Um, and he did a great great job with us. Then I transferred to University of Iowa, where my coach was. Um, a, a track coach knew nothing about gymnastics, um, but that was at University of Iowa where they are now having a 50th reunion to celebrate the opportunities for the 1970s girls teams. And so that's gonna be pretty um, cool in October as well. Um, but anyway, it opened the opportunities for me to teach and then to coach. And um, in co when I first applied for, for teaching and coaching jobs, it kind of flip-flopped. It was, oh, you can coach gymnastics? Yes, we want to hire you. Instead of the most important part was your teaching ability as well, and then your coaching ability. But um, doors were definitely opened for, to, to be a, um, a coach and, and then a physical education teacher. And we had wonderful people blazing the way, besides Betty and Kathy, um, my department chairman, Gayla Clemens, was a, a real uh, trailblazer at Lake Forest, who was the first uh, girls sports coordinator and got us equal um, practice times as the boys and equal gym mm -hmm. time, uh, gym space to, to work out and, you know, told the boys, hey, it's 50-50 here in everything that we, that we do. You you do not come first. And that, that ruffled their feathers for a little bit. But eventually we all um, were on the same page. And um, I know that at Lake Forest, the girls' opportunities were huge. And uh, they did a really, to this day, I mean, the girls' teams are so incredibly strong because we had people, the right people, blazing the trails for us. Mm -hmm. PE was co-ed. I love teaching co-ed PE. That was my, my, my favorite. And um, we had a really big, curriculum that, you know, the boys could be in dance class, the girls could be in strength and conditioning, while climbing for everybody, really, really good opportunities. So I was very lucky. Kathy, how about you? What opportunities came out of Title IX? Well, you know, um, Title IX, like I said a few minutes ago, it opened doors for people and it was like a floodgate uh, opportunities for recognition on an equitable level. Uh, for instance, I competed at ISU and we didn't get, I don't even think there's a picture of us as a team. And my coach, such a wonderful person, but walked in with a rule book in her hand because she knew very little. And so we as athletes taught our coach mm -hmm. about the sport didn't really trust our coach to spot us too much, but we managed to live through everything. And because there were women that came and men that came before us that were willing to help nurture us along, when Title IX came along, we realized how much we could give to um, the students that were coming up and uh, the opportunities then, the doors just opened. Um, I did not get benefits as a student, but that didn't matter. You know, I got to be on the ground floor. I was the caller commentator for the first state meet. And Lori Erickson was, I think, our first all-around state champion. And what a wonderful interview she was. She would sit down with me. My co-commentator was Rick Talley from WGN. And he just let me converse with Lori. And she actually, at that time, opened the doors for other kids. 
they idolized her. She said how much fun it was. Robin, I don't know if you remember Lori, but it just seemed yeah. like from that point on, kids wanted to be like Lori. They wanted to be in the sport of gymnastics. And then came other notable athletes like um, Michelle Hernandez and um, Marianne Kelly and so on and so forth that just were related, relatable to other kids. And um, so I think that's how the doors started opening. So you've shared a lot about how Title IX began and the opportunities that came out of it. What would you tell our current student athletes? Robin, what would you tell them? First of all, I've asked a few if they, what they know about Title IX. They've never heard of it. So I think it's important to just start the conversation as, as you are and um, let them know how fortunate that they are. Um, and they didn't have the opportunities to be athletes, to be lawyers, to be in other professions that that were male dominated and they have those opportunities <clears throat> now. Um, I, I'd say, you know, keep dreaming and keep pushing, keep pushing for equal pay like USA Soccer is doing. Um, keep keep pushing the 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 boundaries as much as as you possibly can. Um, the, the Paralympians, I know they want to get paid, you know, for their medals as much as the re regular Olympians do. The fight's not, not over. Everything is not equal at this point and keep, keep pushing hard for it to be that, but seize your opportunities to continue to, to go out and, um, make your dreams come true and stay a part of athletics and, um, part of the IHSA and, and, and. Keep it going. It's pretty special. Betty? Well, I think the first thing I'd say is appreciate everything you have. Like, first of all, the equipment that the girls are competing on. Like, if they would have ever had to tumble on the wood floors in the wood <laughs> room. And we had no budget for equipment. So my girls were out going door to door collecting dial soap wrappers to help buy equipment. The equipment companies had a sponsored program that if you collected so many dial soap wrappers that you could get equipment. So my girls were out like pounding the neighborhood, not selling anything, but just trying to collect dial soap wrappers. I'm like, <laughs> kids now would just be like floored if they had to do something like, like 50, you know, you would do anything to get equipment for your kids. And, you know, uh, just in terms of leotards, like the girls always had to buy their own leotards. The school would never buy them. And it's like little things like that that are huge now. I look, I mean, I look back and I, our leotards were like these little, almost like cotton type leotards. Well, they were nylon leotards and you put little braid on the top. And now they have these like $200 leotards that are just incredible. So, I mean, <clears throat> they're maybe seem like little things to the kids now, but they were huge in that day to get equipment that you needed. Sorry. Kathy, how about you? What would you tell our current student athletes? Well, I can appreciate that they don't really understand Title IX, but I want them to kind of keep in their mind that society, American society often expects girls just to be in the dance or uh, cheerleading portion of cheering on their male counterparts. But we have, we just concluded the past Olympics and those women Olympians didn't just come out of a box, they started somewhere. And more than likely they started their competitive career in high school. And they were afforded the opportunity to compete. They developed as good athletes. And so I just encourage uh, girls that are uh, inclined to um, be good in any sport, whatever the sport is, go after your dream and you never know where it will take you. We heard that time and time again when uh, Olympians were interviewed in Tokyo. They, they had their sights on being an, Olymp an Olympian 
Sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. But pursue your dreams no matter what they are and no matter what other expectations are expected of you, you do what you feel is best for yourself and be an athlete. We're going to conclude with your favorite memory. I know, Betty, you have one in mind. What's your favorite memory of girls' gymnastics? Well, it's kind of a crazy story, but um, it was in 1977, and <laughs> the girls were not working hard. And I said, well, nobody seems to want to work real hard today, so everybody just leave the gym. And so I went down to my office, and then I thought, well, I better go up and check, make sure all the doors are locked in the gym and stuff. All my team was sitting outside the door. They'd been sitting outside the door for an hour, and they were not leaving. They were going to practice. And I'm like, no, girls, you weren't working hard, so you had to go home. No, we promise we will work hard now. And they came in, and, of course, I had to open up the gym. And it's like memories like that, like the kids that were so dedicated, they wanted to give everything they had to the sport. And kids like that, I think, are like one in a million. It's hard to find kids that are so dedicated. Now, there are so many distractions for girls. But it was just such a rewarding experience to know that these kids, you know, even if you kicked them out of the gym, they weren't leaving. So I love that determination. And, you know, you still keep in contact with those kids today that, um, you know, they pass it on. So many of their daughters were in gymnastics. So they pass the love of the sport on to other people. Some of them are involved in judging or in coaching in some way, shape or form. So it's kind of pass it on and play it forward. Robin, do you have a favorite memory to share? My, no, my favorite moments, though, are having, I had many, many wonderful athletes, and those gymnasts have, have wonderful memories, and they have children now of their own, and the, they have become gymnasts and, and, and excellent athletes in other sports, and I just, I love watching that, athletes that I had then had children, their athletes of their own, and how many athletes I've had continue to be coaches, wonderful coaches um, at, at this point. And so I'm just really proud of that. And a pr you know, proud of any time our teams did well and made it to the state meet. The state meet was always a wonderful experience, especially marching into the music, listening to the national anthem and um, being sung and then starting to compete. That was just, those are wonderful memories. So thank you. Kathy, how about your favorite memory? I think it's a collection because I still live in the same area that I was a teacher at and I will go into a grocery store, or some other area and Somebody will come up and say, I know you don't remember me, but I was on your 19 whatever year team and I wasn't very good, but I had so much fun. And, you know, I, I those are the things that are heartwarming to me that they had enough nerve to come up and say something to me about how much fun they had. They knew we weren't the best, but we always had the long green line wa walking in no matter how good or bad we were, they still enjoyed competing. And I guess I'll just say one other thing. I felt like my opportunity to develop a student into a person with some goals was very important, not just for me, but also the athlete. And I felt like after a few weeks of the season, there were a bunch of little Krebses running around in the gym telling each other, pick up that mat, don't step here, don't do that. Somebody knock on the door. One of the athletes would go over, we're busy right now, we can't talk. But, it, you know, it's just knowing that um, you had a small um, hand in developing sport and um, it made such an impact on some high school kids that have forever good memories about what we were able to do. 
let me conclude today by saying, you know, Betty, Kathy, and Robin, thank you so much for your years of service to the IHSA and to girls gymnastics and for leading the way for the opportunities that so many students have today. You shared a lot of great life lessons, and that's what's so important about high school sports are those lessons and the values that we learn. So thank you so much. Thank you for staying connected and still being officials today as well. We wanted to preserve the past, but yet continue to enhance the future of girls' gymnastics. Thank you.